Welcome. It's great to have you here. It's really great to have Roden here, though, because he's the speaker. If he wasn't here, this would be really boring. So uh, I didn't bother asking him what kind of intro he wanted because I knew I was going to pick this one by myself. This man is a pillar of the community who has just been making all kinds of fun. Well, I mean, I guess phone stuff originally, but, well, I mean, technically it's radio, too, running your own phone network. And then running your own pager network is, I mean, I guess that's kind of loosely related to what are those freak guys, telefreak, yeah. And then a whole repeater network. I mean, basically, he says he's a phone guy, but everything I see up there is a radio. So I, I got to say, this man has been our brother who we've basically never spoken to for years, and I'm very pleased to finally have him at our event. So I want everyone to thank Andrew for his time, and please enjoy Pox Sag Amateur Radio Pager Network. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is uh, kind of a passion that uh, me and my friends and family kind of all share. And uh, RF Tech, Sidney Vicious, was the world's only hacker dog, so I dedicated it to him. I work for Aspirant Security, uh, Aspirant Security Labs, so a shout out to them. Uh, as he said, I'm Andrew Strutt. My call sign is Kilo 6 Alpha Delta Sierra for uh, the Amateur Pager Network and the uh, Repeater Network or Repeater System I brought. Uh, I have an event call sign for November 7 Tango. So uh, that'll be good until Tuesday. So I'm going to go through uh, the PogSec network first, and I have some screenshots for it. I didn't bring the PogSec network. It's actually up in my room, still transmitting and working. So if you uh, uh, page or send a tweet for uh, specific hashtags, it'll come out the pager network and whatnot. And if you're an amateur radio operator and you have a call sign, you can transmit on that frequency with the appropriate cap codes, and you can communicate with it as well. So, um, so we'll get right into it here. So, Talk about how and also the why. So we've been doing this for, gosh, I think five years. And originally the uh, idea was um, me and Jay Falcon were talking about what we could do uh, radio-wise and something really old school. And uh, we got inspired by uh, a former or current old school telefreaker who gave a talk at uh, DEF CON 16. He goes by NYC Mike and uh, Snuffleupagus. So, <laughs> Originally, that was his, his thing, and uh, um, so we decided to bring it back. And it's been a success. This is our fifth year doing it. So um, the idea originally was to uh, put together the equipment and, um, and to design and test it. Um, at the time, when I was talking with Jay Falcon um, about it, and we rolled around the different ideas um, over extreme distances and extreme time zone differences, it was a long process to decide what to do and how to do it. Um, I had engineered it all kind of in my head on paper. And he had some ideas on the uh, software and the coding of it. And so while I was in Afghanistan, I ended up buying all the equipment and did some tests with it. And then I sent it all to Jay Falcon. So major props to Mr. Jay Falcon, who uh, did significant uh, amount of grunt work to make it all work while I was overseas. And, then, uh, and it's been a success ever since. So uh, it pretty much boils down to these, these five pieces of, of equipment that make it work. So and I'll show you some of the pictures. But, uh, most of it really relies on, obviously, the transmitter for the PogSac, um, which is a cheap Chinese black box. Um, not necessarily Part 97 FCC compliant, but in doing experimentation is something that you can do with amateur radio, and, uh, and it works very well. So um, the other piece is the uh, amplifier, and I'll show you a picture of that. Um, we're not pushing 100 watts. The amplifier uh, will take uh, 10 watts in to produce 100 watts out. Um, last time I tested it a few years ago when I was a little worried about it and doing the uh, RF exposure math because the antenna was in my hotel room the first year. So that was pretty funny as we discussed that and doing the, uh, the measurement of the radiation exposure. Hey, can you see it? And um, so uh, I think we're only pushing maybe two or three watts out of, the, out of the transmitter into the amplifier. And when I last tested it, it was like 40 watts out of the amplifier. Now, the antenna that I have is a uh, um, Diamond uh, X50N in connector, and that's a 5 8 wave high gain antenna uh, uh, used for repeaters, and it's almost commercial grade, very widely used in the amateur radio community. Um, the other point I bring up and bring this up is the feed line in the antenna makes a huge difference. Even if you have a crappy Chinese transmitter and a quality amplifier, if you're not using good patch cables and good feed line, you're going to get a lot of loss, and it'll add up throughout all your cabling and through the antenna as it gets to the antenna, and you won't get very good signals. So this is one of the things that I've pushed and, and learned over the many years of doing amateur radio and engineering is to use quality equipment, quality connectors, um, and it really makes a big difference on the, on the actual uh, uh, endpoint. 
So the cabling's important, and obviously the laptop, but that's kind of the simplest part was, um, well, maybe not the simplest, because I needed help with it, but because I'm not a big coder, but over the years, um, I think there's been every year a new generation of people who have sat down at my laptop and like refactor the code. And in fact, uh, Mr. Tucks here wants to refactor the code. He's refactoring code extraordinaire. So he's been begging me all week, saying, let me get on your laptop and rewrite the code. So um, I think Jay Falcon wrote it the first time. I fussed with it, and then Farr fussed with it and rewrote it. And then uh, um, I think that might be it. Maybe Jens from the CCC did a couple iterations on it. And so it's kind of a group effort. And it's a simple Python code that just communicates over serial. Um, and so we'll get a little more into it. So here's the. Pogfax, uh, Pogsack and Flex Transmitter. It'll do Flex, which is the more sophisticated protocol. And um, we wanted to, even though it could do a little bit a better protocol and our watches can do the better protocol, we wanted to keep it even more old school. So we, we continued with Pogsack, even though we could do Flex, which does uh, uh, bigger payload, more data you can push through it. You can do time sync and a bunch of other things, which is cool, but we wanted to keep it extra old school. So. Uh, that's the transmitter is all it is. It's, um, I found it on, uh, I want to say one of those sites like Alibaba or something like that, or Banggood. It's one of those Chinese sites, and we search and search and search. What they sell them for over there um, in excess all over the place is for like restaurant pagers and stuff like that. Um, those aren't really used much here in the U.S., but paging is still used all over uh, for many different um, industries, and it's, it's a huge information disclosure issue. Um, and I'm not going to repeat a lot of that. I'm going to mostly talk about the hardware and our implementation of it. If you want to cover all that, definitely see uh, NYC Mike's talk uh, from Def, uh, DEF CON 16. And he covers all the intimate details of decoding it and so on. So a lot of good information there, but I'm not going to dig too deep into that. But also Vlad Goskomelsky is here who can also help. He works with me at, at Spirant. And if you want to get into decoding paging and need a little uh, pointers, uh, Mr. Goskomelsky can help with that. He's, he's at Recompiler, so he's right there. So I appreciate his help too. So, uh, so this is a good piece that makes it all kind of happen. Not only do you need a good feed line and a good antenna, but you need a good amplifier. Obviously, we could turn up the power on the transmitter, but it's only capable of maybe five watts if, if the Chinese specs are right. But we turn it down so it's not going to work so hard, and we let this do all the work. This is a high-quality amateur radio amplifier, um, and you can see it'll do anything from 430 megahertz to 450 megahertz. And as I mentioned before, 10 watts in and 100 watts out. Um, it uses N connectors for UHF, microwave uh, frequencies. Um, and it has some of the other features in there that we don't use for amateur radio stuff. So it's a high quality amp. It doesn't um, have any spurious emissions and any issues like that. And that's one of the things I was uh, adamant about is when I was going to build this and do this is that A, we could stay legal. And B, we weren't going to spam the bands with you know, a bunch of spurious emissions. and piss off local ham operators and whatnot and so on. Um, one thing I do, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit, is I am members of the uh, local ham clubs here in Las Vegas. And so I do a lot of research on, on uh, frequency listening and uh, making sure I'm not going to stomp on other people's projects and other repeaters and so on. So we were, um, we were adamant about uh, choosing the right frequency. And fortunately, uh, for the last five years, no one's complained. Um, every year we come back, I always check in with my local ham buddies and see if anyone's complained or wanted to file a complaint or so on. Because they, they could file a complaint to the FCC if they were pissed. But um, they, no one has, thankfully. And I've been on a good frequency that no one seems to be using. Uh, one of the things that we do, uh, and I'll get into a little bit more, is that in the software, um, it does send a call sign, but it doesn't show up on the pager because it doesn't send it with a cap code. So every 10 minutes, there is a call sign that's sent out for this time. Um, it is N17, November 7 Tango for Telefreak. And this is one of the creators of Telefreak Champ right here. And uh, so this year, it's a, an event call sign. Previous years, it was um, other Telefreakers call signs, either myself um, or Sleestack's call sign, or who was the other ones? Nerds. Nerds, yeah. Uh, what was it? N3RDS? <laughs> Yeah, so we've used different call signs all legally. Um, um, but this year, I, I saw that it was very easy to get a one-by-one one event call sign with the, coordinated with the ARRL. And uh, I got that this year. And it, they approved it within the same day or the next day. And so I was pretty excited about that to have that. So that's the, uh, this is the big piece of it, is to have a good amplifier. Obviously, you don't need to drive it too hard. Um, when it's paging really hard, when people are hammering it, the, the amp does get a little bit warm. But compared to some of the other amateur radio stuff, um, it's more like lukewarm. Where some of my other equipment, for example, the uh, UHF 70 centimeter repeater, 
um, it can essentially get up to like lava hot. This only gets up to like lukewarm because we're not working it too hard. Um, one of the interesting things is that we do link it to Twitter and a couple other things, but Twitter has 140 characters. Poxac only allows 90 characters. So most tweets come out in like three pages. So it's not really efficient, but we're cramming new technology into old technology, but it, but it works. So as I mentioned, the feed line, and I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but it's very important to get good feed line. Uh, LMR 900, don't use RG58. Uh, you need good shielding, good connectors on the end. And when you get an adapter, you need a good adapter. So I, uh, to get into the Chinese transmitter, um, it's BNC. So I adapt in to uh, BNC, and I made sure there's all gold connectors and, and so on. So that's, that's an important piece. It makes a huge difference. You lose um, approximately half a dB per connection. So one connection, two connections, and then the other connections on the back of the amp, I mean, you're losing a couple dB through that. So you wanna minimize that loss so you get as much power to the antenna, which does some amplification naturally, um, and it makes a huge difference. I've built a lot of amateur radio systems, I've done a lot of engineering with that, and, and I've gone where I've used the cheap connectors, I've used the cheap coax, um, and it works, but then when I update it with new stuff, it works like 40% better with the same amount of wattage and so on. So antenna makes a big difference, and uh, uh, the feed line makes a big difference. So for the cabling and whatnot, it's just serial into the back of the Chinese transmitter, but if you notice back um, in the, one of the other slides, it does have RJ45, it will talk network, but it only does telnet. Um, the web interface, uh, it was so atrocious, I, didn't, I saw it once and I never looked at it again, never tried. Uh, uh, Jay Falcon looked at a couple of the other interfaces that the, uh, that the transmitter had, but we decided just to maintain old school and just keep it serial, super simple, and it works really well. Um, when I get into the other talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of the serial interface. So this is just a normal USB to a serial interface, um, but it's a, one with a more sophisticated driver so that you can tweak um, the latency, the buffers, the speed at which it'll communicate serial. Um, the, the Chinese transmitter doesn't like anything over 9600 baud, and not even 9600 baud fast. Like if you try to go exactly 90, it's, it'll, it'll skip characters, it'll drop out. So I slow it down a little bit just to keep it happy. Um, and mostly for this kind of stuff. So that's an important piece. Fortunately, I've had this thing forever. Um, and I only have one and I've been trying to find another one that has that special driver and I haven't had any luck. But uh, it's an important piece there. So I run it off a virtual machine. And as, a, as you guys know, I am the rodent. So you'll see some of this stuff in there. <laughs> uh, um, so it just runs off a virtual machine off of Ubuntu. Um, I think it's, it's five years old. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it never touches the internet, really. So, um, well, one way with the reverse tunnel. So, um, so it just runs on a virtual machine with a virtual serial adapter, and, and that's how it communicates to the transmitter. And also, shout out to 2600 and to the Telefreak badge crew. As you can see, this is our badge this year. So, so that's an important piece because if there's no data to push into the transmitter, it's obviously not going to work. But it's very simple. We try to keep it as simple as possible. It just runs with a, a simple set of Python scripts that just dump the data to serial, and the transmitter just accepts anything you throw at it over serial. So um, like I said, it does send the call sign every uh, 10 minutes, and then it does send cap codes for different types of messages and so on. Uh, Vlad had asked me to do some special cap codes, but unfortunately I didn't have time to do it, but we might be able to do that a little bit later. So. Uh, but the cap codes are important for the uh, POXAC decoding, um, and, and you can get more information on that from Vlad. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's all like uh, put together. Um, it's not super fancy, but you need a good power supply, um, and obviously there's the amp in operation, and there's the transmitter, and then it's just serial to the laptop. Um, so this is a good uh, switching power supply, so there's no spurious noise off of that, no AC hum, stuff like that. That can affect the, um, not only the RF transmission, even though it's, it's digital, uh, but it can affect noise getting into um, other things. The serial and all that is important. So for overall reliability of your system, you want to make sure that all these different components are of higher quality. If you can, go commercial grade, uh, but amateur radio grade is, is, is effective enough. So that's an important piece uh, is have a good power supply to make it all work. Um, and I like to have things mobile, transportable, and be able to use multiple power uh, uh, interfaces or types. Um, so I try to run everything all 12 volt, because uh, it's easy to get 12 volt off of batteries and to convert that and so on. So that's what it looks like when it's all wor look working. 
Um, I took this picture this morning. Um, I rebuilt it all last night. There was a little bit of interference or jamming or something like that, but that seemed to go away, and I wanted to uh, deconstruct it and rebuild it all back again, the repeater and the transmitter for, uh, for the PogSack, and it's all, it's all working good now. So, so the legalities around amateur radio is, is not that difficult. Um, to get into amateur radio, you can learn a lot. Um, to get a simple technician's license, it's only 36 questions, multiple choice. You only need to answer 27 of them correct. So the entry level to get into it is, is very easy. Um, and it's $13 for 10 years. And it gives you federally licensed ability to experiment and to do all these cool things on the amateur band. So I encourage people, if you want to transmit PogSack, get a ham license and don't stomp on those bands. And I request that, the FCC requests that. But it's also just gentleman's agreement or just being polite with your neighbors and so, stuff like that. And that matters. Um, we all have to cohabitate in the RF spectrums, whether it's cell phones or Bluetooth or whatever. But in particular with amateur radio, there's an important piece to that. Now, talking with other old school ham radio operators, I've had them argue that it's illegal, that you can't do it. And so the two bullets in Part 97 FCC that I pull out um, is beaconing, which is used all over the, all over the place for uh, uh, propagation testing and stuff like that, and then also broadcasting transmissions. Um, it used to be that you could only broadcast to, to everyone if, um, if it was like the space shuttle or QST from the AWRL, stuff like that. So they've since modified the wording a little bit since we don't fly the shuttle, unfortunately. Um, but you can't broadcast with intended reception by the general public indirect or relayed. So there's other bullets that do fall under this type of uh, um, transmission, but these are the ones that I think follow uh, what we're doing the best. And so it is legal. Um, it's very easy to be legal, and, um, and, I, and I ask you to do that. So one of the pieces that, that works, and I mentioned it before, is coordination, to know your local ham operators that you're going to be sharing those frequencies with, potentially, uh, to know your local ham clubs and whatnot, get friendly with them, you know, uh, the last ham club I joined in, uh, in Washington, D.C. was $25 for five years. So, I mean, it's not really hard to get in with those guys. I went to their um, uh, amateur, day, uh, amateur field day. I brought my repeater out. And, uh, you know, you can learn a lot from these guys and share information, and they'll kind of look out for you as well. So if you're using a frequency or doing something wrong, they'll give you some help. They'll give you some advice. Um, uh, just yesterday, uh, Drugi brought another uh, friend of ours, and he's an amateur extra, the highest class you can get, and he's helped me diagnose some of that stuff. And we're all on the same page, but it's nice to be able to bounce stuff off other hams and other tech-savvy people uh, to either validate what you're thinking or to invalidate it, say, no, you don't know what you're thinking, it's something else. So it was nice to be able to talk with other hams, and it really works well. Research, one of the things I did um, is just to uh, Google my face off to find what other people are using on frequencies and these types of transmissions, um, and that's a big effort of it. And then also just listening and observation. Before I get on a frequency and start stomping out and using it, I'll listen for days or weeks at a time to see if anyone else pops up on that frequency and uses it. So you want to share it and be polite about it. PogSack, uh, the transmissions are very intermittent, so it comes and goes, so you're not necessarily transmitting all the time. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to determine if you're messing with someone or not. So um, one of the things I did we, before we started transmitting here in Vegas was ask local hams, ask the local clubs I was a part of, and then I just listened to the frequency that we use, 433 megahertz, uh, 500 kilohertz, 433.500, and I listened to that for weeks uh, remotely over the internet and then while I was here on site before we started transmitting. And even when I came back five years later, this time, before I started transmitting, I turned on all my radios, and I listened to that frequency for hours to make sure that no one was, is using it while I was gone. So it is coordinated in that sense, um, but it's not necessarily official, like a, a permanent repeater pair that, that gets coordinated with local clubs and with the AWRL and so on. So observation is a big deal. Um, if you've done your research and your observation and you still can't feel comfortable with it, always fall back on your band plans. AWRL does publish all the plans uh, for different frequency spectrums, and they do also have slices in some of these spectrums for experimentation. So if you're doing something that's um, polite and neighborly, um, but you isn't necessarily Part 97 compliant, you're doing experimentation, you are allowed to do that. And that's one of the cool things that I got into amateur radios because um, like years ago, before we even had the TSA, I would carry my ham radios on planes and stuff, and they would harass me. I would show my FCC license. Oh, I'm federally licensed. Like, I can carry this. I can use this. And they don't know what to say. <laughs> um, don't transmit when you're on a plane. With the, uh, 
Trust me, you don't want to do that. Legally, um, if you have the permission of the captain of the flight, you can transmit. I've gotten that permission before, um, and I was able to talk on a repeater uh, network from like 250 miles away from Sacramento. That was the best I ever did on uh, VHF. Um, but I had the permission of the captain. Um, since then, many years ago, I think they've kind of tweaked the rules, so, but I think the captain has the ultimate um, say on that. So definitely uh, utilize your clubs and peers um, that, are, that you're sharing the spectrums with. That's, a, that's an important piece. So um, let me see what else I got here. That's towards the end of it, but you can always find us on rc.2600net. Um, all the Telefreakers and us hams and hackers are in Pound Telefreak. You can chat with us, and you can follow my Twitter, Andrew underscore Strutt, and uh, this is basically what I look like when I'm working. So I think that's 25 minutes is what I had. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer any. And uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Lindsay here. When are you going to get an extra license? Uh, the question is, when am I going to get an extra license? And actually, I've been studying for the general. I'm, I'm big on baby steps. So I'm pretty confident with the general. Um, I've had a tech plus for like uh, ever. So um, I do want to upgrade to general because that gives you um, more bands that you can use, um, I think higher power transmission and certain bands and so on, um, and a little more credibility with my fellow peers who are ham operators as well. So uh, good question. I'm working on it, but baby steps. I'm not going to jump up to extra. Um, I'll, I'll get the general first. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, B, what's your question? Uh, what's the range? And tell me about your source code and your methodology. <laughs> okay. So the question is uh, range. And uh, source code methodology, our naming convention. Okay, so the the best range that we ever reported was um, Sleestack drove was like driving home or somewhere, and he was all the way out by state line, past Gene, got to the California state border, and before he got over the hill, he was still getting pages. So that was well over 50 miles. Um, fortunately, that year I had a nice suite, and it had windows like uh, three quarters of around my room, and so I had the antenna like with half the view down the strip and half the view down to the southwest to California. And so it really depends. The propagation really is affected by um, antenna placement and which hotel suite I get. So um, that's been the best recorded range that was verifiable was from Sleestack over state line over 50 miles. Um, but it definitely saturates um, the casino or the immediate quarter mile. Um, yeah, it does. The range is quite good. Now, the follow-up question that he had was about our um, highly complex uh, source code naming convention. And like I said, um, we've been doing this for five years. There's been several iterations of the software. And so um, the naming convention I think we're on now is test four. <laughs> so, um, and once it works, it works. So you know, I haven't like pushed it to GitHub or anything like that. But I might do that. But it's very simple stuff. You're just dumping the raw data to the serial port. You know, uh, Tux could tell you there's like a half a million different ways you can do that with Python. And he'll probably do it a quarter of a million different ways. So, but it, we do keep it simple. And once it's working, we're not going to beat ourselves up over it, and you know, and, and make a name for it, copyright it, trademark it. You know, we tested and tested, and like the third or fourth time, it worked. And 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 remember what it's called, because sometimes I just I just suspend the VM until next year. And I open it up, and I'm looking at the scripts, and I'm like, God, what was the last one we used? Look at the history. We use this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. <laughs> um, but we had to go by date this time. So I looked at the date. It's 2016, August, and, and we're able to find which script we used last time. Um, so that's uh, the majority of it. It's the implementation of what makes it all happen and whatnot. And we can get more into decoding PogSAC and whatnot, because we're certainly spamming that band. There's a lot of information, a lot of RF going out there. And, uh, and you can decode it. It's, it's cool stuff. Uh, Tux, you had a question? What does the TSA say about me dragging my equipment on the planes? Well, nothing very pleasant. Um, they have a lot of questions. Um, I, I use my FCC license pretty heavily. Um, I use my government ID pretty heavily to, obviously, I'm not just some schmuck with a bunch of gear who's going to try to take apart the plane while I'm flying with tools and so on. But this year, um, I actually uh, paid the oversized fee and packed it all in one big giant box. So I carry my handhelds, I carry some tools with me and so on. But like the, this repeater and the other stuff, um, I, I didn't have it on my carry-on. So TSA didn't say too much. Um, 
Uh, but I did have them pre-inspect it before they accepted it to go down. And so I stood there as he opened up the box and went, holy Christ, what is this? FCC license. You know? <laughs> so, and, and he's like, okay. And he, what is this? And uh, FCC license, you know. So it, it's, it's effective. And um, just told him I'm an amateur radio operator. And this is my equipment. And they don't know. Um, and it's not illegal. It's just they have questions and they have to swipe it down and all that stuff. Um, but they do always ask about my handhelds and why I have that on the plane and so on. And um, one of the things that, that Vlad and I do is Aries Amateur Radio Emergency Service. And you know, all of our other comms aren't always going to be there. And so you have to fall back on what still works, and that's amateur radio. So any other questions? Good question. Sure. How much is an event license? How much does an event license cost? Um, it's totally free. Yeah, you just go to ARRL. There's a website. I think it's 1x. 1x1call.org or something like that. You can Google it up. Uh, you just apply. Put in your call sign, put in your information, what you're using it for. And for me, they approved it the very next day. So uh, a couple other questions? Here, he was first here. We'll get you. We'll yes, you can. Uh, the question is, can you do um, things like APRS messaging through PogSAC? Uh, for example, Flex has more. Uh, features within that protocol, not necessarily location stuff, uh, but I'll get into, I have another piece that does do APRS and location-based stuff, but uh, the protocol was, this was like 30, 40 years ago. Um, now, the other piece I'll remind you is the information disclosure. If you start decoding the stuff out there, you'll find stuff from telecommunications, um, uh, aviation, medical, and all kinds of stuff that's out there th to decode. Um, decode it legally, do it ethically, um, don't propagate that information unintentionally. Uh, but my favorite one was watching pages to um, central office technicians where they get the address of the central office, the door code, and <laughs> what they're supposed to do at the central office. So with that page, you know, yeah. So there's another question. Yeah. So the question is regarding formalities or proper etiquette if you're going to transmit on PogSAC or use the hashtags and whatnot. Um, obviously, some rules apply because it does go from Twitter to uh, amateur radio. Um, I think the only major stipulation that is an issue for me is, is cursing, unfortunately. It's not censorship. It's just you, know, you don't have to be a dick all the time, so you don't have to curse. Um, but um, that's, I think, the only thing that, that is really an issue is just um, uh, that sort of thing. So. That's the question. Yeah. Um, I've actually been looking at it this time. Uh, four previous years, we never had a problem with it. This year, um, there's something different. So, uh, sorry, the question was, um, are we doing anything to filter uh, the content that we don't like? Um, so we try not to. It's usually not an issue. Um, I think I only noticed it a couple times in the previous years. But for some reason this year, I guess people curse more. They're talking to me more, and I curse a lot. So <laughs> not on ham, but um, so yeah, great question, though. And we'll look at that more as we advance the code over the years. Every year, there's a new reiteration, a new refactoring. Uh, uh, there'll be a test five Python script for next year and, uh, and, and so on. So, uh, but that's a good question, and we'll look into that. Especially, I want to stay as compliant as possible. Um, it's certainly an issue. Um, and I was thinking about it that long and hard the last couple days, because right out the gate I started noticing it, and I was like, ah. So um, any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Great questions. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. <laughs>